Uh, a big thank you to my Patreons who make this content possible. You are very much appreciated. I quite often on this channel compare trans identity to a religion, often with reference to how society treats it. So my most frequent analogy is comparing the idea of being saved in Christianity to being trans in trans ideology. Because saying I'm saved is an objective truth claim you're making about yourself, but it also carries with it a whole load of other beliefs that are necessary to make that claim. While it might vary, a typical view of salvation within Christianity would involve believing that there is a god, that that god is perfectly good, and as such being separated from that god would be a very bad fate, uh, but that because god is perfectly good, he can't abide with sinners and we are in fact all sinners, therefore God had to send himself to live as a perfect human being, but despite being perfect and not having any sin, he then suffers a painful and humiliating death, and while he does that, and he's experiencing that unjustified suffering, he actually takes upon himself the punishment for all of humanity's sins, so God's justice can be satisfied by the sin having been punished. And now, as long as somebody isn't trusting in their own works, and is trusting fully in the efficacy of Christ's sacrifice as a propiti propitiation, I know I wasn't going to get that, for our sins, we can be saved. I guess you can tell with all that why I've timed this video to be released at Easter. Now, lots of people aren't going to believe all of that, and some people aren't going to believe any of it. So, it would be pretty silly to suggest that we must affirm the identity of saved Christians because lots of people just aren't going to have believed any of the things that are necessary for the idea of a saved Christian to make any sense to them. So to say you must affirm that person's identity would be to say that people basically have to lie about their own beliefs. Now, trans identity in the form of, for example, a biological male claiming to be a woman is also an objective truth claim about reality, and it also carries with it a whole load of other beliefs you need to believe in order to say that. Now, I would like to explain what those beliefs are like I just did with Christianity, but that's not really possible because while the viewpoint in Christianity people might not believe it, it's at least coherent and you can actually explain it and explain the internal logic of it. The problem with trans identity is that Lots of people disagree on how exactly trans identity works, and many of them can't even give you any real, even approximate account of how exactly a biological male can be a woman. So you have to believe that a biological male can be a woman, but how exactly this is achieved is something they're not clear on. And of course, there are other categories like being non-binary, and they can't really explain any of those either. So basically, a lot of the time, they'll just have to resort to saying, well, if you identify as a woman, then you're a woman. So the act of saying you're a woman makes you a woman. But of course, that's incoherent because it then means you have a circular definition because you're defining woman with the word woman in it. Trans identity is less credible than basically any religious view, considering that even they can't tell you what they believe. And yet, despite that, and despite the fact there's no reason to believe it, it is not at all socially acceptable to say that you don't believe in trans identity. And that is basically the way I compare trans identity to religion. They are both claims made about reality, and they're both claims that a lot of people consider to be quite spurious, but with one of them, it is basically acceptable to disagree with it. If you say that you don't believe in it, uh, most people will think that's perfectly normal in the Western world. People have even made whole careers out of disagreeing with it, and that's considered quite legitimate. Whereas in the other case, if you do that, you're considered a bigot for disagreeing with it, and it's actually something that basically torpedoes your career and will apparently people think, ruin your entire legacy. So that's the basic sense in which I compare them, and of course there's one way that I wouldn't compare trans identity to a religion, which is to say that they're both equally wrong or nonsensical, and the reason I wouldn't do that is because I am myself a Christian. And in some sense I arrived at my Christianity in the same way I arrived at my gender critical beliefs, which is to say I looked at the claims being made and at the arguments and the evidence and the logic and I weighed it and thought, does this make sense? 
And in one case, in the case of Christianity, I thought this seems like something that is more likely than not true, while in the other case, I thought the arguments here are really lacking and I don't think I can believe this. But I can anticipate some people might be thinking there has to be some cognitive dissonance here. I mean, if I can accept the non-materialist elements of the Christian religion, why can I not accept the non-materialism of the claim that the categories of man and woman are defined with reference to something other than biological sex. Just in general, how can I reject trans identity by saying that it's not been sufficiently argued for and there's no evidence for it, and then accept Christianity when isn't Christianity just something that you take on faith when all of the evidence is actually running against it? Well, since it was recently Easter, I thought I would treat everybody to a brief overview of how these two distinct parts of my broad worldview intersect and play off each other. Uh, I should warn you that because I talk about gender critical beliefs all the time on this channel, I'm not really going to be talking about the gender critical side too much in this video because I speak about that all the time, whereas I don't really speak about my Christianity. So I'm going to be talking a lot more about Christianity in this video than I will about being gender critical. Uh, however, I think for anybody who knows me and you know has any interest in why I believe what I believe more generally, this should be an interesting and instructive video. I guess the first thing I should address right out the gate is, am I just against trans identity because it's a sin or something? I imagine this would be uh, disappointing for a lot of people because it would mean that something which I have heretofore justified with secular reasoning was in fact something that I just believed because God said so. Um, and that would be kind of dishonest because I've never really given that impression on this channel. And the good news is, uh, I'm not dishonest. Uh, the reality is that that's not the reason why I'm against trans identity. Not only is it true that my secular reasons for opposing trans identity are sufficient that they would stand completely on their own, even if I weren't Christian, but also I'm not even sure there is a real Christian reason regarding sin to oppose trans identity. I mean, the ultimate reality is that trans identity is so nebulously defined that it would be quite difficult for the Bible to condemn it, especially considering the fact that the idea of trans identity has evolved so much and is so tied up with all sorts of cultural ideas that I don't even think the concept of trans identity existed in the first century for the Bible to condemn. The obvious thing people might point to is where it says God created humans male and female, uh, but that doesn't necessarily go against trans identity. You could still say, well, he created male and female, but males can be women. There also are parts of the Bible that uh, endorse various uh, traditional views of masculinity and femininity, most obviously in Titus. But again, it could be the case that someone would just say, well, I still do the kind of traditional masculine or feminine roles, but as a biological male who identifies as a woman. So again, it doesn't preclude the possibility of somebody identifying with a different category. So long story short, if you take somebody like Blair White, there's no reason to think that Blair's lifestyle would be condemned by the Bible, at least as it relates to trans identity. In fact, when you consider the command against men lying with other men, it would seem that trans identity might be a convenient, but certainly legitimate loophole for people like Blair White and other HSTSs as they're called. So if I thought there were secular reasons to affirm trans identity, there'd be nothing biblical to contradict that. And this is before even getting into the question of whether or not it's always appropriate to just take the plain reading of the Bible. Even if we are just taking the plain reading of the Bible, there's no part of the Bible that plainly read says biological males must always be men and biological females are always women. In fact, I could point out that in Christianity, there's two and a half obvious exceptions to this idea. The Holy Spirit and the Father are both rocking he, him pronouns, despite not being biologically male, because they're not even human. And then, of course, there's Jesus, who was initially the same, neither biologically male nor human, although he did eventually, through the incarnation, get his adult human male status. Although this isn't that significant, because obviously God is going to be an exception to a lot of things. Uh, he's quite an exceptional being. He's the only being that we know of who is three persons, 
Um, and for example, Jesus is the only human we know of who was 100% human and 100% God. So yeah, we should expect to see lots of exceptional attributes for God. So all in all, taking all of the sins that we might think there are from a plain reading of the biblical text, none of them would suggest a problem with being transgender. So you might think this video would be over then. Uh, if the Bible doesn't say anything about trans identity, surely my views on trans identity must be unrelated to Christianity. Um, no, I actually think there is a significant connection, several significant connections, but they're just indirect. And I think it makes sense to start with the connection that is in some sense the reason, the initial reason why I'm actually gender critical in the first place. See, when I was at university, I was an atheist and I actually challenged myself to learn a lot about different religions. In fact, rewind further, I used to be an anti-feminist and I challenged myself to learn a lot about feminism to you know, see if I could learn something that would change my mind, and it did. So I thought, well, let's try now doing that for my atheism and challenge my atheism by learning about Christianity and other you know, major religions. But in the back of my mind, I thought, well, let's try to motivate my research uh, by having a core kind of guiding principle for it, which is if I did believe in God, what religion would I think was convincing? Because I was worried otherwise I would just kind of be reading it and I would kind of just zone out because I would think to myself, well, okay, that's interesting, but I don't believe in God, so blah, blah, blah. I thought, well, if I did believe in God, what would I be looking for that would convince me that this religion is right about God. And obviously I didn't study every single religion ever, but I looked at the big ones and obviously a very big religion is Islam. So I studied that. And uh, let me tell you, uh, Islam is, is a mess. It's a disaster. And when you look into it with that kind of idea of, well, let's imagine that I believed in God and I wanted to find out about God and see if there was a, you know, a holy book or whatever that could convince me that it's right about God. When you look at it through that lens, Islam is even more of a mess. Now, I don't want to get into that in this video. You know, this video is not going to be wanting for length, but there are historical critiques, literary critiques, logical critiques, theological critiques, and of course, moral critiques. And there's just one that I would like to talk about for this video. Surah 929 says, fight those of the people of the book who do not truly believe in God and the last day, who do not forbid what God and his messenger have forbidden, who do not obey the rule of justice until they pay the tax promptly and agree to submit. You might have heard of that verse before, but chances are you've probably heard some, you know, hand wavy explanation from Muslims about, oh, you know, context and whatever else. And you thought to yourself, well, I guess that makes sense. I mean, aren't all religions kind of just pick and choosy? You know, you just take whatever you like. And it's not as if everybody follows all of the commandments of their religion, whatever religion they belong to. So I guess we can just say that that's something that, you know, Islam commands, but Muslims are basically at liberty to come up with these hand wavy explanations for where they basically pretend it doesn't exist. But let's say you set yourself the goal of actually learning about Islam. So you didn't just want to accept a hand wavy explanation. Well, the first thing you'd probably want to do is read the rest of the passage and you would find just a few verses later, verse 32, they try to extinguish God's light with their mouths, but God insists on bringing his light to its fullness, even if the disbelievers hate it. Just so we're all clear, let me present what I think is a pretty obvious plain reading of that text. First of all, it's not saying that Muslims should kill all non-Muslims, absolutely not. But what it is saying is that Muslims should subjugate non-Muslims such that non-Muslims are no longer comfortable criticizing Islam because that would be extinguishing the light of God with their mouths. And of course, that is utterly incompatible with a liberal country where people should have free speech to criticize any idea. So if you were in Saudi Arabia or Afghanistan or Malaysia, and you started criticizing Islam in a way that could draw people away from it, then you would be trying to extinguish the light of God with your mouth. And Muslims are commanded to fight you until you feel subjugated because you're doing that. So maybe they'll warn you and then maybe they'll arrest you and then maybe they'll torture you and you know they might give you time to say, okay, are you are you subjugated yet? Are you going to stop? Because you know we have to fight you until you're subjugated uh, as a non-Muslim. And obviously you if you then continue to say, no, you know, I'm not a Muslim, I think Islam is nonsense, 
and you know I'm a, I should be a free person who's free to express my thoughts and my beliefs and you know as a free person I have to criticize this book because I don't think it's accurate and I you know I think Muhammad's a false prophet and the Quran is a false book well if you keep doing that you're showing that you're not subjugated Muslims have to keep fighting you until you are subjugated until you stop trying to extinguish the light of Allah with your mouth, or the light of God, I should say, um, there is going to be a point at which they kill you. And I could talk about all the other texts in Islamic literature that make it clear that killing people as part of this fight is completely legitimate and even noble and honorable. But I want to stress two key points. The first is that in verse 11, 1, it says that the Quran is perfectly clear, and the second is that in verse 465, it says, By your Lord, they will not be true believers until they let you decide between them in all matters of dispute and find no resistance in their souls to your decisions, accepting them totally. So not only does the Quran claim to be perfectly clear, so you can't really try to argue, well, it doesn't really mean what it means, but to even be in a position where you are wanting to try to find some alternative reading, it would have to be true that you have some resistance to the plain reading, and that you have some resistance, according to the Quran itself, would mean you are no longer even a true Muslim. And finally, there's this one hadith in al-Bukhari in 3651, which basically says, you know, Muhammad's asked, what is the greatest generation of Muslims? And Muhammad says, the first generation. And he's asked, okay, well, who's the second best generation of Muslims? And he says, the second generation. And he's asked, who's the third best? He says, the third generation of Muslims will be the third best. It seems to imply that basically Muslims are just going to keep getting worse and worse and worse. And the most faithful Muslims will be the first Muslims who, you know, were originally the followers of Muhammad. Uh, yeah, and then it's just going to get worse and worse. So that pretty much precludes the possibility of any novel reading of any part of of Islamic literature. So as far as I'm concerned, if I'm going to have a conversation with a Muslim, before we have that conversation, that Muslim needs to admit that they think that I should be subjugated until I am no longer free to criticize their beliefs, because there is nothing else they can possibly believe from you know that those verses I just read based on what you know the other verses indicate about how the Quran is to be read and understood. Um, otherwise, they'll have to admit that they are not a Muslim. Because the only other alternative is that they claim to be a Muslim who rejects everything that Islamic literature says. And at that point, they're a liar, and I'm not interested in speaking to liars. You might be wondering how this relates to me being gender critical. Uh, it's actually quite simple. Once I realized this, I realized that the common narrative you are told from the, you know, kind of progressive left, that Islam is just perfectly viable as a part of the wonderful patchwork of multicultural religions just doesn't work. It doesn't make sense. Islam is actually incompatible with living in a free liberal society where people are able to express their you know, issues with certain ideas. So once I realized that that progressive idea was a myth and it couldn't actually be justified, I started to think what other progressive ideas that I've accepted are in fact wrong. And that led me to then think, hey, you know, I've kind of always had these doubts about the trans identity thing, like I've never really understood it. Maybe I should consider the idea that that is actually also a nonsensical idea that's in fact a myth and isn't justified. And well, here we are. But I'm sort of putting the cart before the horse here, or at least a half a cart before the horse, because, you know, it's not just progressive saying, well, you know, you can read Islam this particular way, which of course is wrong. But what they might say is, well, uh, the reality is all religions have this problem. So if we're going to have any religion in society, we need to accept the idea that all religions just have these big problems that make them fundamentally incompatible with a liberal, tolerant society. And none of these religions can reasonably be reinterpreted any other way. So we have to, therefore, if we're going to accept any religion, accept that Muslims are allowed to say, well, I just disagree with, I just ignore these parts of the Quran I don't like, and I even ignore the parts of the Quran that say that if you ignore parts of the Quran, then you're not a true Muslim, and I am in fact a true Muslim, uh, despite rejecting all that stuff. But, I mean, is this true? Does Christianity have any part of it that would make it incompatible 
with a liberal tolerant society? Well, not really. I mean, Jesus Christ is the pattern of conduct for Christians, and he was tortured and executed for his beliefs, for what he said about who he was. So the idea that Christians, you know, there's any expectation that Christians can use violence and the state to silence dissenting voices would not seem to be uh, even allowed for in Christianity, never mind explicitly and inescapably commanded. But let's imagine just for fun that that verse existed, and there was a verse that said we should uh, subjugate those who try to extinguish the light of the gospel with their mouths. Well, could we, you know, would we be forced to interpret just the plain reading of the text from that? Does the Bible claim to be perfectly clear in the way the Quran does? Well, uh, no, it doesn't, basically. There is one verse, um, 1 Corinthians 14.33, which says that God is not the author of confusion, and many people misunderstand that verse and think that's saying, well, God's not the author of confusion, therefore nothing in the Bible can be confusing. Uh, that's actually talking, if 1 Corinthians 14 is talking about church discipline and the way that services should be structured, and it's basically saying that the organization of the services should be structured in a way that isn't confusing. Uh, it's basically talking about chaos when it says confusion, not how clear something is, just that you shouldn't have everybody shouting and screaming and there's no order to the service, and that's what it means when it says he's not the author of confusion, he's not the author of chaos, of anarchy, of discord. Indeed, on the contrary, in Matthew 13, 13, Jesus actually specifically says that he sometimes preaches in parables so that it will be confusing, so that people are forced to actually think more deeply about what he's saying. And with this said, it's not surprising that the Bible actually does seem to encourage Christians to think critically about the Bible. In 1 Thessalonians 5, 1, it tells Christians to test everything and to only hold to that which is good. In 1 Peter 1.10, it talks about the prophets who inquired and researched diligently to arrive at the conclusions that they've reached. There doesn't seem to be any reason why we should think it's unchristian to interpret the Bible with a skeptical lens and to look beyond the immediate plain reading of the text. And there's definitely nothing in the Bible that talks about the earliest Christians being the best Christians. So for all we know, it's completely legitimate to suggest that the correct interpretation might appear now or in the future. And there's nothing in the Bible that would suggest that would be you know, a wrong thing or an impossible thing to happen. All this is why, despite the fact that earlier I presented the plain reading of the Bible as validating the ideas of traditional masculinity and traditional femininity, and also condemning homosexuality, I do in actual fact think that there is a lot of cultural context that should change us from reading just the plain meaning of the text from those passages. I mean, specifically in the case of sexuality, that's a very fluid thing, and pretty much every historian and anthropologist agrees that the idea of sexuality was understood in a very different way back during that time. And it wasn't uncommon, for example, for men to have a wife with whom they would reproduce, but then they would have male lovers in addition to that. And of course, that's adultery, which the Bible very explicitly condemns. Uh, add on to that the role of male cult prostitutes and all sorts of pagan religious practices. And it's not unreasonable to think that actually what the Bible is condemning is all of those other practices which at the time were very much tied up with uh, homosexuality. And of course, the fact that they were writing in Greek and they didn't specifically use the word homosexuality, you know, they used some various Greek words that are taken to mean the same thing, uh, gets to another fact, which is that the words that the Bible was written in, or with which the Bible was written, are the words of contemporary human beings. It's not the explicit word for word, word of God. Rather, it is the word of human beings who were inspired by God. And this is in contrast, of course, to the Quran, where anything it says, that was exactly the exact words that God dictated, supposedly directly, or I should say, you know, via Gabriel, dictated 
directly to Muhammad, supposedly. I think there are actively good reasons to read the Bible in an LGB-affirming way, but the main point I just want to stress is that, if nothing else, based on the way Christianity presents itself, it's clear that we have the option with a lot of these passages of reading them in various ways where there is some interpretation to be done and some consideration of context, and that's simply not true of the Quran. So when you put all this together, you realize that this idea of like context and reinterpretation as this kind of one-size-fits-all thing, where it just applies equally to every religion, and if you're going to accept it in one case, you have to accept it in every single case, this is a nonsense idea that doesn't stand up to any scrutiny, and the only people who actually believe it are the people who just haven't thought about it intelligently or critically for a second. So you might be thinking that was a pretty long-winded way of explaining what can basically be summarized in a sentence, which is that I looked at Islam, realized that a lot of what the progressive narrative says around Islam just doesn't make any sense, and that made me skeptical of other progressive ideas too, like uh, the affirmation of trans identity. But all of that was actually laying groundwork for another connection that I personally see between my Christian belief and my gender critical beliefs. Uh, but before I get into that, I'm going to string you on for a little bit more by talking about this tweet that I made on Good Friday. Imagine if Christianity isn't true and Genesis talking about a wounded human defeating death God providing a sacrificial lamb for himself, and somebody being betrayed by his countrymen to the local superpower to save everyone, is all just an insane coincidence. Happy Good Friday. And I made this follow-up tweet. In before, you can draw these connections with any religion and any religious book. And then I attribute that quote to somebody who isn't aware that Islam desperately tries to find Judeo-Christian validation slash foretelling of Islam, the Quran and Muhammad, and has been unable to find anything in the entire Bible. These two tweets together basically sum up the main reason why I'm a Christian. And the first tweet is making a simple observation that Genesis, despite being written way, way, way before the Gospels, has loads and loads of little hints towards the life and ministry of Jesus Christ. The specific examples I give are, first of all, in Genesis 3, God says to the serpent that a descendant or an offspring of Eve will crush the head of the serpent, and the serpent will bite the heel of this son. And obviously, you can very easily read this as the serpent represents death, uh, which is a consequence of human rebellion against God, and, G and the son of Eve represents Jesus, who was of course born of a virgin, so he didn't have an earthly father, so it makes sense to understand him as specifically a descendant of Eve, who was the original woman, and he of course crushed the head of death by dying on the cross, but was in turn wounded um, by death and human rebellion because he was uh, executed by secular authorities um, of course, when he was crucified. Then in Genesis 22, we have the story of the fake-out sacrifice of Isaac, and as they're walking up the hill, Isaac says to Abraham, hey, you know, we've got all this stuff for a sacrifice, but we don't have a lamb. And Abraham says, don't worry, when we get up there, God will provide the lamb for the sacrifice. So then they get up there, and they discover a lamb with its head caught in some thorns. And of course, later on, Jesus who is God, so therefore God is providing the sacrifice, and he's also, you know, known as the lamb, uh, dies on a hill, is sacrificed on a hill, and he's wearing a crown of thorns. So God provides the sacrifice on the hill, wearing a crown of thorns. So Genesis 3 is right at the beginning of Genesis, Genesis 22 is right in the middle, and then in Genesis 50, we get the conclusion to the story of Joseph, and Joseph was betrayed by his fellow countrymen, and he was sold out to the local superpower, which was Egypt. But despite this, Joseph ends up actually being instrumental in getting Egypt to store up grain so that when the famine comes, he's able to save people from starving, and they're able to come to Egypt for you know salvation from the famine. And Joseph says in Genesis 50, as for you, you meant evil against me, but God meant it for good, to bring it about that many people should be kept alive as they are today. Of course, Jesus Christ was betrayed by his fellow countrymen to the regional superpower, and despite that being a very evil thing that happened, God does end up using that for 
good to save many people. So that's point one. Just in Genesis alone, we have these obvious foreshadowings of Jesus' life. And these aren't like uh, twisted analogies where you have to really kind of manipulate them and, you know, ignore some things and really hyper-focus on other things. Uh, no, just a plain reading of these stories. And you're like, oh, this is pointing towards Jesus, obviously. Now, you might be thinking, well, so what? Okay, sure, you've got these connections in Genesis and, you know, obviously there are other connections throughout the Old Testament kind of uh, foreshadowing Jesus. And I didn't want to get into all of them because I wanted to give full attention to those three specific stories, but there are many more. But you might say, okay, well, so what? I bet you can take any two stories and you can just find these connections. Oh, look, it's a, it's a prophecy. It's, it's magic. Um, I'm, I'm sure like that's what a lot of people might be thinking. It was certainly my attitude when, you know, I first kind of looked into this, like, well, is this really that special? But that's when point two comes into play, because Islam also has a lot of religious claims that they make, and the author or authors of the Quran probably knew at least a good bit about the Bible, and they certainly had every incentive to try to find connections between the Bible and the Quran, considering that the Quran specifically mentions in verse 7157, the messenger the unlettered prophet they find described in the Torah that is with them and in the gospel. So they, they find Muhammad described in those books. They had every reason to try to draw these connections. So does the Quran actually do this? Does it succeed? Well, no. The Quran, despite saying that we find Muhammad mentioned in the Bible, doesn't tell us where. And it says specifically that, you know, the parts of the Bible we have, we find uh, Muhammad mentioned, but doesn't tell us where. And you're okay, well, what about later Muslims? How have they done? Well, they've tried. Uh, they've come up with a handful of uh, examples in the Bible where they think, oh, this is showing that Muhammad's coming. Just a handful. And they've been looking for ages. And I'm not going to go through them all, but I mean, I'm not really going to go through any of them. But what I'll just say is that all of them, it's like maybe just one thing. It'll be like maybe one vague reference that could maybe be Muhammad if you squint. Um, but they're very few and far between. And a lot of the time, they contain details that explicitly rule out Muhammad. And they'll even have to say, well, uh, you know, the, the part we have is the part that seems to be talking about Muhammad, but the bits that like completely rule out Muhammad, like for example, there's one about, it talks about, um, there's going to be a prophet like Moses. And they'll say, well, that prophet like Moses is obviously Muhammad. And it's like, well, first of all, they, they don't have any reason to think it must specifically be Muhammad. It could be literally any of the other prophets who came after Moses, and Moses was a pretty early prophet, so there were lots of prophets that came after Moses. But it specifically says, uh, who performed many miracles, so th this is the category, a prophet like Moses who performed many miracles and knew God face to face. Now, Muhammad famously didn't perform many miracles at all. There's only, I think, one major miracle attributed to him, which is that he supposedly split the moon in half at one point. Okay, that's not many miracles. Um, but the other thing is that he didn't know God face to face. According to the actual story, Muhammad received the Quran from the angel Gabriel. Moses received the Torah, you know, according to the kind of traditional idea, uh, from God face to face. So even the two things, and these are the only two things they say that they're like, this is what makes the prophet like um, Moses. He performs lots of miracles and he knows God face to face. Neither of those two things are true of Muhammad. And, and I suppose actually I should say the, sorry, I'm going off script, but I, it's just, it's hilarious. The, because I'm kind of like, well, the Quran doesn't tell you, the, the unlettered prophet, I'm not going to remember where it is. I think it's Jeremiah. It could be Isaiah. Um, but Basically, there's a specific part where it talks about a prophet who's illiterate, and that's what it means when it says unlettered. It means an illiterate prophet. Here's the thing. The illiterate prophet in the Bible is actually given as an, ex as an example of Israel's rebellion. It's talking about how Israel's become so spiritually stupid and blind that they're no longer able to read the Bible. And therefore, there's this hypothetical example of a prophet who can't even read. And that's supposed to show how stupid Israel is, that they've completely fallen so far away from uh, God's word that their prophets can't even read the Bible. And there's another prophet who's somebody who can read the Bible, but he refuses to do so. And it's reached a point now where even though that is the most obvious connection between the Bible and what it says about finding an unlettered, you know, illiterate prophet in the Bible, 
most Muslims won't even like claim that that's what it's referring to because they're smart enough to realize that claiming that the Quran is referring to a you know hypothetical prophet who's given as an example of Israel's stupidity and disobedience is probably not a good move if they want to validate Islam, even though that's very obviously when you look at the language um, what the Quran is probably talking about when it says that we find an example of an illiterate prophet in the Bible. It's the illiterate prophet who's literally given as an example of how stupid and morally blind and corrupt Israel has become. I might find the verse actually. Okay, so it's from Isaiah 29, and it starts, like the main bit starts at verse 9. It says, Astonish yourselves and be astonished. Blind yourselves and be blind. Be drunk, but not with wine. Stagger, but not with strong drink. For the Lord has poured out upon you a spirit of deep sleep, and has closed your eyes, and covered your heads. And the vision of all this has become to you like the words of a book that is sealed, when men give it to one to, who can read, saying, read this, he says, I cannot, for it is sealed. And then they give the book to one who cannot read, saying, read this, he says, I cannot read. So it's saying, you know, look, you, it's like you're drunk, you're staggering, you're blind, and this is like giving a book to a prophet, and the prophet says he can't read. That's like, anyway. But look, okay, you know, we can all rouse on Islam, but here's the thing. Can you do better, right? Because again, we always say like, oh, well, I'm sure you can do this with anything. But ca can we? Like, I, I can't. Like, I, I look at the way that the Old Testament just sets up all of this stuff that's written by different, dozens of different authors across hundreds of years. And it's all setting up this stuff. And it's, you know, not just the fact that it's all these little hints that kind of work towards the gospel, but then the fact there's nothing in there that would theologically contradict anything that comes later. Can you, can you even imagine that you would be able to do something like that, to just like take any book, whatever it was, it can be the Bible, it can be whatever, and just come up with a story that works perfectly in a way that is not only hinted to multiple times with all sorts of, you know, stories that can easily, readily be read as a uh, kind of parallels with this kind of new story you're adding, but doesn't contradict the previous kind of story with all the different commands and stuff and theological truths contained within are on any point. I like to think of myself as a rational, reasonable person who says, well, let me just think, what is the explanation that makes the most sense? What am I compelled to believe as somebody who always tries to follow where the evidence and the facts and the logic lies? I can't read that, this the, the Bible, and say, oh, this, this is just, you know, it's just a coincidence. It's just kind of like magic or whatever. Well, again, I can't say magic, right? It's just like somehow just a load of dozens of different authors over hundreds of years just came up with this thing that works in this incredibly intricate way where it's all connected. Um, no, I, I can't do that. I have to say, no, this must be the, you know, come from some source that has a greater purpose that is above the authors. Um, that, that's what I have to do. But I get it. Okay, you're thinking like, what does this have to do with trans identity? Sure, the Bible is like this intricately connected, interwoven, you know, all that kind of stuff. Wow, very impressive. But what does this have to do with the idea that biological males can be women? Well, I will keep you suspended in, in suspense no longer. So the connection is basically from my perspective, there is a big similarity between the way that atheists and trans identified or trans ideologues claim that there is this one specific area where we kind of just can't know anything or we can't make claims that obviously are in reality actually true. See, the big claim you hear from atheists all the time is, well, even if we believed in God, we'd have no way of knowing which religion is actually true. And that's insane to me as someone who my primary reason for believing in God is a reason that would necessitate that if God exists, then Christianity specifically is the true religion. So for me, because I find the truth of Christianity, if God exists, to be near certainty, I tend to spend a lot of my time arguing with other theists, so Muslims or Catholics. And I suppose this would be a good time to say that since New Year's, I have made a YouTube channel and it's basically, it's a YouTube channel I posted to a long time ago, but I started to kind of reinvigorate it. And it's basically just me explaining the Bible and a lot of the kind of arguments around the Bible and around religion, um, because I personally don't struggle when I'm talking to a Catholic or I'm talking to a Muslim and they make a claim about the Bible or about, you know, a kind of 
supposed theological truth, it is not difficult at all for me to explain, well, no, here's where you're going wrong with that interpretation. Here's all of the passages that contradict your interpretation and that you cannot reconcile with your interpretation. Or here's um, the reason why logically what you're saying doesn't make any sense uh, in terms of your kind of theological critique. Uh, that's something I've never really struggled with. So I thought, well, you know, honestly, I should just do that. Like it's an easy enough thing to do. I should just kind of, you know, I've been having these arguments all the time. Uh, the weird thing about Twitter now is that it's kind of like designed to keep you perpetually, I guess, like engaged because every now and then I'll see like a religion post and I'll be like, oh, that doesn't make any sense. So I'll like respond to it. It means that next time I get recommended even more religion posts. So a lot of my Twitter now is just filled with religion stuff, um, which is kind of disencouraged me or discouraged, I should say, from using Twitter because I'm always like, I, I get angry because I'm like, this is like, how can you say that? How can you say that's what the text says? It so obviously does not say that. Um, so it gets me frustrated. So I've kind of, you know, used Twitter less and less. But the point is when I've just finished, you know, demolishing some Catholic or some Muslim with a terrible argument um, that just makes obviously no sense, or I've just made a, a video for you know, a new channel, which you're welcome to check out, um, explaining like, no, this doesn't make sense. Or, you know, this this is obviously the wrong way to read the text and it should obviously be read this way. Um, it's really funny to me when I then speak to an atheist who says, well, you know, the real reason why religion makes no sense is because basically it's just a lottery. Like, you know, it's just down to all sorts of random factors and there's no logic or coherence to it at all in terms of what you end up believing. So I recently saw this video about William Lane Craig and basically he was saying that, you know, when he first heard the message of Christianity, he just intuitively understood that it made sense. And this uh, atheist was taking him down saying, uh, well, actually, if this guy heard the message of Mormonism first, he'd probably just conclude that Mormonism makes intuitive sense. It's like, no, no, you wouldn't hear a message that says, oh yeah, turns out that there were white people who lived in America uh, a thousand years ago, but then they all died and they left behind no archite architectural evidence for it whatsoever, except for this one book that can only be read by a guy who was like a known con man. And he said, well, you know, I've got this information. The only logical thing is for me to get a load of wives so I can sleep with lots of women. Um, and, you know, isn't it convenient that this religion that's based on just these books I found and nothing else happens to validate everything that would make it great for me to, you know, live my life in, in the perfect way that I want to live it. Um, wonderful. Isn't that fantastic? To suggest that someone would like, the, the I, I can't get my head around the idea that someone would be like, well, yeah, obviously, if you hear that, then you're just as likely to find that intuitively compelling as you are to find Christianity. It's such a obviously like contrary to reality thing to say. And basically, you know, when I see trans activists say things like, well, if you say a biological male can't be a woman, obviously you have to conclude that a black person, like a black female, can't be a woman. Like, obviously, like, how could you possibly say that a biological male can't be a woman and then say a black female can be a woman? And, you know, they say all sorts of other stuff like, you know, nothing's a binary. You can't define any words properly. There's, there's like, there's no actual definitions for anything. Truth isn't real. Uh, biological sex doesn't exist. They say all these things, which are wrong, but they're specifically wrong in a way that's basically making it so that you can't actually say things that are obvious about reality. It's that specific kind of denial of an obvious epistemological reality. And in both cases, I think there's an interesting inconsistency, because of course you can't be consistent with this. So atheists will say things like, um, oh, you know, you're saying that your interpretation of the Bible just makes sense. But you you can't know that. That's not like a that's not a way that you can actually engage with a text or you know what somebody's saying. But atheists do that all the time. Like you've been watching this video this whole time, and you have been hearing what I'm saying and knowing that what I'm saying is what I'm saying. And if someone came along with a radically different interpretation of what I was saying, you would say that's wrong, because you know that you can actually like just read something or hear something. And say, well, yeah, I just know what that means. Obviously, that means this. Uh, so, you know, again, there's that kind of inconsistency of thinking, well, you just can't interpret something and know that you're interpreting it correctly. And yet that's simultaneously what everybody does the majority of the time their ent entire day. And of course, trans activists will say things like, well, you can't disagree with somebody's you know, self-identity. 
But trans activists will hear people make claims all the time and will be able to say, well, that claim's either true or false. And they don't make an exception if someone's making a claim. You know, if I say I'm 10 foot tall, trans activists will know that that's not true, even though it is a self-identity claim. I'm claiming that I am 10 foot tall. Trans activists know that's not true. So there's that inconsistency again. And I guess one of the reasons for that kind of connection is that both religion and the kind of proper use of words are both sort of nebulous concepts. They're not really about empirical reality. You're not going to, you know, kind of just through the scientific method, discover which religion is true. And likewise, you're not going to look under a rock somewhere in a molecule formation and find the kind of engraved definition of woman there. So in both cases, we kind of have to look at it holistically and look not just at the kind of empirical stuff, but also philosophy, anthropology, things like that. Uh, how was the word woman used historically? What was the implication of that? How is it used now? What reasons are there why we should look at it differently? Similar, th you know, similar kind of questions for religion. What what claims is this religion making? Does that line up with what we know based on secular evidence or secular logic? Um, you know, do, does do, are there claims in the text that are just obviously incorrect? These are things that you want to look into, uh, and then you kind of want to think, well, what also is the text trying to say? For example, you know, obviously the Bible has um, something about pi being exactly equal to three. Well, that's because it's not a maths textbook, so that would be an example of where there's an error, but it's not like I say, a maths textbook. But the point is, in both cases, despite it being like nebulous and there being all these challenges, you can actually just look at it and say, hey, you know, um, yeah, biological males can't be women. And you can also look, yeah, yeah, sure, it's complicated, right? Like the Quran's long, the Bible's longer. There's, there's, there's all sorts of arguments and things like that. But believe me, you can look at it and just say, yeah, actually, like Christianity makes way more sense than all these other religions. In fact, so much so, that it's kind of hard to explain why it stands so, like, towers over the other religions so much in terms of credibility, apart from thinking that there actually has to be a god who is behind it. I think the term I'd use for it is just accurate arrogance, where, you know, there's a point where something does get so nebulous that, of course, it's very, very easy for people to go down the route of just saying, well, like, nothing's really true. We can't really work any of this stuff out. I mean, you know, like, we're talking all the intersection of all sorts of different fields here, phenomenology, anthropology, history, theology, uh, you know, literary criticism of all sorts. It's just, it's just impossible. And it has to be a point at which you can say, no, no, I can survey this landscape and I can hear what people are saying and I can evaluate what they're saying. And I actually, I can say, no, you're, you're wrong or you're right. This is what the truth is. Um, biological males can't be women. Christianity is true. And I'm not saying like, oh, well, if you recognize and like agree with me about what I'm saying about, you know, how we can just look at how it makes sense to use a word. And there is like a reality to just how it makes sense to use the word woman. And it's not including biological males. I would imagine, you know, if you're a fan of my channel, you agree with me on that. I'm not saying that you must therefore agree with me on me saying, you know, on a similar kind of nebulous question of like, well, what does it mean for religion to be true? Questions like that, where you will get people who just say, oh, you know, we can't really know anything similar to the kind of trans identity thing. I'm not saying you have to agree with me on that, but I hope you can at least see how, from my perspective, as someone who it's just like obvious that biological males aren't women, and it's obvious that like, no, you, you can look at Christianity and recognize that it is different from Islam, which, you know, I showed you how like ridiculous the claims of Islam are. Like with the whole, oh, we find Muhammad mentioned in the Bible. The Quran itself says we find Muhammad mentioned in the Bible. It's supposed to be the word of God. If it's wrong on that, how can anyone take it seriously as a religion? Um, but like, that's the thing. And it's like the second largest religion in the world, uh, perhaps going to be large again, nominally. I don't actually think like, you know, these kind of self-reported things. I don't really think there's like over a billion like real Christians. Um, but, you know, self, self-reported, it's the largest religion in the world. It's obviously wrong. For me, that's significant. And it's like, this isn't like, oh, it's obviously wrong, but oh, aren't all religions obviously wrong? Don't all religions have, no, no. It's, it's wrong in a really significant sense. And I hope you can at least understand that from my perspective as someone who, who sees that, who sees that this is just, and, and a lot of other religions 
and just wrong in obvious ways, ways that Christianity is not wrong. Um, but from my perspective, there is actually a similarity there. And it is something where I, I do view it as a, a kind of arena where I'm having to think about the situation in similar ways for both cases. I also think the concept of presuppositionalism casts some interesting light on the connection between religion and trans identity. Uh, I guess, first of all, we probably need to explain what presuppositionalism is, because a lot of people seem to think that it's basically just, well, if we assume Christianity is true, then Christianity is true, or something to that effect. Um, no, that's not what it is. Imagine an atheist and a Christian are debating, and they're both trying to make points to convince each other. A presuppositionalist looks at this and they say, hold on a minute, why are we having a debate as if we're just accepting that a debate is the logical starting point? Because a debate isn't a logical starting point, because a debate is presupposed upon other beliefs. Those beliefs being that there is such a thing as truth, that we can discover truth, and that we should want to discover truth. So why is having a debate the accepted first step in discourse between Christians and atheists? Shouldn't the first step be to look at whether the belief systems and the worldviews of these two points of view even allow for the presuppositions that underpin you know, the utility of a debate to exist in the first place? So when you look at Christianity, Christianity believes that God is truth. So obviously, Christians believe in truth, Christians believe we can know God, which means we can know truth, and they believe that we should want to discover God, which means we should want to discover and understand truth. An atheist, on the other hand, believes there is no conscious agent behind our existence at all. We are basically just molecular accidents. So it's going to be much harder for an atheist to justify the presuppositions that truth exists, that we can know it, and that we should want to. So a presuppositionalist is basically asking, well, why should I debate your worldview when your worldview isn't even capable of justifying the beliefs that are axiomatic to the function of the debate in the first place? And presuppositionalists sometimes get annoyed at evidentialist Christians because they feel like the evidentialists are letting atheists get away with something. They'll say, hey, why are you debating? with these people and providing them evidence when they're not even capable of explaining why, in their worldview, any of what you're doing actually makes sense or has any value. Now, I'm personally not a presuppositionalist. I'm an evidentialist. I think that the Bible is good, strong evidence for the existence of God. Um, but I do think presuppositionalism is interesting, and I definitely kind of get secondhand embarrassment when I see atheists who think that presuppositionalism is just the belief that if we assume God exists or, you know, assume Christianity is true, then it is. But the other reason I find it interesting, as you might be uh, already anticipating, is that presuppositionalism basically says that the problem with atheism is that atheism can't justify the beliefs that truth exists, that we can know truth, and that we should want to know truth. And you might have been noticing that over recent decades, even, you know, as much as recent centuries, the Western world has been becoming increasingly atheist. And it's hard to ignore that in even more recent decades, there has been a growing movement of people who do think that there is no such thing as truth, that we cannot know truth, and that even if we could know truth, we shouldn't want to know truth. Uh, these people are the postmodernists, and they are the kind of people who've given us queer theory and trans identity. So maybe that is something to think about. And I want to say one final related note, which is that when I posted the kind of tweet that I already mentioned about, you know, the connections between Genesis and uh, the Gospels, I got a reply from somebody who follows me, but I think they're a trans activist. Um, I do have a few kind of trans activists who follow me on Twitter, which, you know, well done, you know, they're broadening their mind to other points of view. But they replied saying, I couldn't imagine caring about any of this. And to me, that's insane because, okay, look, whether you believe in God or not, surely if God exists, that's important. Surely that would matter. Surely you can at least imagine caring about the question of whether or not God exists. And yet, I don't know, because, you know, right now, nominally, most people believe in God. And historically, even more people believed in God. But there are a lot of people, atheists, who, like, it doesn't even interest them the possibility that God could exist. And to me, that's that's weird, um, because I was like, well, you know, if loads of people believe this, that's interesting. I have to know what's going on there. But there are a, a number of people 
for whom it's just not something they even care about. And of course, that's the final interesting parallel, because right now we have people saying that biological males can be women, and they're using like the power of institutions to push this idea, and this idea is causing real harm. But even ignoring like the real harm, just the idea that a, a false notion is being perpetuated um, in so many places, and so many people are being asked to play along with this. And I'm like, well, I have to care about that. How can I not care about like just a, a falsehood being spread everywhere? And no one or like very few people are challenging it. But the majority view on trans identity, just so we're all clear, the majority view is, let's be honest, well, sure, maybe it's complete nonsense, but who cares? Like number of people who actually sincerely believe in like the concept of non-binary, for example, just to take an idea that's even more obviously nonsense than trans identity generally, um, number of people who sincerely believe in that is probably very low. But um, there are a lot of people who are like, eh, yeah, yeah, it's nonsense, but who cares? Right, okay, yes, sure, our schools are just teaching something that's just, n never mind a lie, never mind unjustified, doesn't even make conceptual sense, but who cares? So there we go, that's kind of four areas where I think there is a parallel between my experience with talking about Christianity and my experience talking about trans identity. Uh, firstly, that I think a lot of progressives are wrong on issues kind of relating to certain religions and the political implications of those religions, and realizing that made me realize they're also wrong on the issue of trans identity. Uh, secondly, there are a lot of people in the discussion around religion who just can't accept the fact that there are things we can know, meaningfully say and know about like what makes sense, what ideas are more credible than other ideas uh, when we're discussing kind of religion and especially comparing religion with each other. And the inability to recognize that reminds me very much of the people who just aren't capable of saying, no, we can know what the words male and female mean, even if it's slightly confusing as an issue. Uh, and then, of course, there is the uh, kind of issue of atheism, arguably not being able to fully justify a worldview that puts truth front and center, and what we've seen in society as society has become more secular. It's also had a rise in postmodernism. Uh, and then, of course, there's the fact that in both cases, in both discussions, inexplicably, there are a large number of people whose primary position seems to just be, I don't care. And that makes no sense to me. Anyway, I'll wrap up and just say, you know, if you want to check out my channel that has to do with religion, I will leave a link to that there. I probably at some point left a link to a video from the channel um, up there. Uh, it would probably just be my most recent video. Yeah, I think that would be an interesting thing if you'd like to follow that, just to see what I have to say on that issue. Um, and, you know, of course, you know, offer any challenges, I, I would very much appreciate that. Apart from that, I'll just say, you know, of course, please give on Patreon. That's really appreciated and subscribe star as well. Um, I, I mentioned before that I am now uploading uh, new, uh, like, reaction videos for Patreon and subscribe star only. And I was actually, I really wanted to post because the recent reaction video I did was really fun. There were a lot of interesting points I explored. Um, I think it's very much worth checking out. And I was actually going to include a kind of little teaser promo here. Look at what's written on that white bucket there, sex. All right, sex is a word. So why don't we just say the word sex is cultural and then the word sex goes into the gender category. Oh no, what do you know? We've now just uh, arrived at the conclusion that sex and gender are the same thing. Like that's the problem. You can't say this. You can't be like, oh, you know, he, him, she, her, are obviously in the gender category because it's like cultural, sociological categorizations. Because the difference between sex and gender itself is a cultural and sociological distinction and categorization. We didn't have to use the word sex. We don't have to use the word penis and vagina. It is a social decision we make as a society, and it is uh, reinforced culturally that those are the words we use. So why don't we say that's gender as well? And if we're going to say, well, no, obviously that's not gender because that's describing actual physical biological reality. Well, so are the words he and she, him and her. Like that's describing biological reality too. So why does that go in the gender category? Thank you so much for everybody who does contribute. Anyway, I will see you all next Wednesday.